Well, I'm here with Shankar Krishnamurti, uh, General Manager of the EDA uh, Group at uh, Synopsys. Shankar, hello. Hello, Nitin. Good to see you again. So we're going to go and talk a little bit about uh, some of the trends in industry that are impacting some of the stuff you're doing in the EDA uh, business and the hyper hyper trends, I suppose, and the hyper convergence. So tell me a little bit about, uh, to start at the beginning, what's what's happening? Yes, Nitin. So this is clearly a very exciting time for the semiconductor industry. You know, you've seen all the analyst reports predicting a trillion dollar industry by the end of the decade. And really, we see six uh, key trends or high value problems uh, that we need to overcome as an industry in order to achieve that, uh, that potential. Uh, the first one, of course, is uh, for all the Moore's Law doomsdayers, Moore's Law is alive and well, and the march to angstroms continues with uh, 18 Angstrom already here, Path to 14 being announced by several foundries, mm. and great research work on you know, ongoing to enable 10 and 7 Angstrom. We see the transition to multi-dye is absolutely happening uh, as the costs of uh, uh, the dye at the most advanced nodes are, are increasing significantly. Uh, we are seeing this trend of rapidly migrating designs across different nodes due to wafer supply constraints and other geopolitical constraints. Which even leads to more multi-dye. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, we see things like uh, a significant increase in verification complexity as, as uh, customers are looking to get first time right silicon, uh, five nines reliability in domains like uh, data center and automotive to achieve 99.999% uptime. And the thing that wraps all of this is productivity, productivity, productivity. At a time when um, the total number of engineers joining the workforce to work on these amazing designs is really not that significant. How do we dramatically improve the productivity of uh, the engineers to really enable these ambitions that the semiconductor industry has? Well, I mean, that leads us to, you know, everybody seems to be going into data science for the to address the AI, but, mm -hmm. uh, well, we need the, uh, the chips as well. So how do you enable that chip design? You're, you're using AI and EDA, you've got DSO.AI, which mm -hmm. I think was launched either year, last year or the year before, I can't remember. But, um, yeah, tell us all about this AI and EDA and how it's going to enable that productivity, but also some specific examples of where, where sure. that's happening. Yeah, absolutely, right. So I think, um, first and foremost, uh, Synopsys was the pioneer in applying AI to EDA. Uh, back in 2020, we first introduced uh, AI technology for design, which is our DSO.AI uh, engine. And we have seen just tremendous progress with respect to the customers adopting AI to, work, to improve their designs, both from an engineering productivity perspective, but also to improve the power, improve the performance utilization. Oh, of, you, you of can get designs. a lot of optimization. That's, that's right. Using, using that iteration. Well, it's iteration, but then AI using that. Exactly. Yeah. Because, you know, fundamentally, what AI is doing is it's enabling the rapid exploration of a parameter space mm. uh, and doing it very intelligently. So if I am a, uh, an up-and-coming engineer at a large semiconductor company, AI becomes this amazing assistant, which is enabling me to get expert quality results mm. without necessarily understanding all the complexities of the tools. Mm. So what we have seen is we have rapidly gone from milestone to milestone. The first AI-enabled tape-out uh, was done with the Synopsys DSO.AI. We just crossed 240 tape-outs with our DSO.AI technology at pretty much all the top semiconductor companies, and many of them you've covered yourself, uh, companies like ST and Microsoft mm. and NVIDIA and, and, and many, many others. But, uh, you know, we saw that an opportunity here on AI, not just for design, but why not apply AI to the entire EDA stack? Okay. So if you look at the full EDA stack from design to verification to analog design to test manufacturing, AI can have a similar disruptive effect on all these different steps. And so synopsis.ai is something we introduced earlier this year at Snug, where we essentially broadened our approach to AI across the full EDA st software stack, uh, impacting verification in a very profound way by enabling coverage closure in a significantly reduced time, impacting test in a profound way by reducing pattern counts, for which is one of the key metrics of test, and impacting analog design in a significant way by automating the migration of analog circuits from node to node. So mm -hmm. it's really, uh, from our uh, uh, you know, uh, perspective, a, a very profound technology that is going to impact the entire EDA 
uh, end-to-end stack. And uh, so our approach is really something which is both deep in terms of uh, developing that AI technology that produces good results, as well as broad in terms of applying it across all the elements. So, so 240 tape outs, I mean, is there any sort of, what's the flow, yeah, say, take an example from that. What's the flow, how, how is somebody gonna do something really fast? I mean, how quickly can they get it through you know, what you're doing? I mean, there's so many things like productivity, there's mm-hmm. efficiency, there's power performance. Give us one or two examples. Yeah, so you know, so typically the way customers start off with uh, with DSO.AI is nobody believes that AI is going to beat an engineer. Well, that's, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's almost always where we start, and yeah. so they generally give us uh, their most complex design, saying, mm-hmm. "Look, I've tuned this. This is the best PPA I could get. Show me what your AI can do on this." Mm-hmm. And generally, we take the customer's flow with our tools. We basically wrap our AI engine around it, and almost always, and this is at pretty much every customer we've engaged with, we found a way to take a highly tuned design and extract several percentage more of power or, or area or performance, which then kind of opens up everybody's eyes that, you know what, yes, the machine can search the, the overall optimization space more efficiently than, uh, than what the best engineers can do because everybody's time constrained. And then from there, we essentially evolve it to making AI part of their mainstream flows, where essentially you have your base uh, EDA flow, which produces a certain level of results, and then the AI augmented flow then automates the search of a better result and then arrives at that better result. So it Mm. starts off as, give me the best possible PPA, Mm. and then it broadens to make my engineers more productive by having AI as an assistant to enable them to deliver expert quality results. I think I've heard something a phrase called assistive EDA. I, mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. probably something like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, so, exactly. Um, exactly. So, yeah, yeah, one of the things I think you talked about was um, uh, you know, helping them to get more productivity, etc. But uh, are there any sort of areas where you think they might have um, challenges? Because, I mean, for example, oh yes, so the, let's, let's move on to another area. Mm-hmm. So I think you know, there are challenges, but when the customer accesses, um, you talked a little bit a couple of years ago about um, uh, EDA in the cloud and mm-hmm. access to that. Is this kind of capability available via the cloud or is it still that sort of um, license uh, seat model which uh, people have to buy the license to? Yeah, actually, so we are uh, enabling our AI technologies through the cloud as well because, as you know, AI and compute go hand in hand, mm-hmm. right? I mean, because you do need a lot more compute in order to explore that solution space efficiently. And so we are uh, basically offering our DSO.AI capability through the Synopsys Cloud so that customers can essentially uh, use the cloud for the compute resources and have access to the AI technology through the cloud. And is that happening? Because I I think, um, I remember when I last had a conversation with you, um, it was being adopted, but you were, I'm not sure that I got an indication of how Mm -hmm. fast that cloud Yes, uh, EDA adoption has uh, been. You know, we announced uh, our cloud offering uh, last year, yeah, um, I read and uh, it is rapidly getting uh, picked up by the customers, right? Because essentially, we have two offerings. One is uh, really the first EDA SaaS offering. So we are offering your entire EDA flow as a SaaS capability, and there's a high level of interest in uh, new and upcoming companies or small groups and large companies that don't have access to. EDA infrastructure, yeah. there's a lot of interest and we're seeing very robust engagement over there. And then uh, there's the second offering, which is the bring your own cloud, where you oh, have yes. a large on-prem presence, the cloud is a way for you to burst, to accelerate a characterization job or accelerate physical verification jobs. And that model is also uh, very robust right now in terms of how customers are bringing cloud into their on-prem uh, environments to accelerate workflows. And is that the way things will go, you think, in the future? Yeah, I, th- I think it's going to be really split this way. I think um, uh, pretty much every new startup, uh, I predict, is going to be born in the cloud and stay yeah. on the cloud. Okay. Uh, and so that's really what we are seeing. Well, is that's the, what we saw with the dot-com boom. That's things. right. <laughs> now it's in the uh, chip boom, I guess. Exactly, because as you know, in software, right, there's no software startup that does not just born in the cloud and, and stays in the cloud. Yeah. And there's no reason why chips won't go in the same direction, especially now that Synopsys provides the whole EDA flow as a SaaS uh, capability. One of the areas I think um, is always, uh, well, RF design and analog has always been seen as a black art. How are you changing that 
from being a black art to something that you can incorporate very well into EDA. Yes, you know, so this is uh, really one of the, the, you know, the most important segments of uh, the EDA space where there are so many circuits that are being done in a relatively manual approach, uh, relatively labor intensive approach. Uh, and, uh, you know, with all these aggressive timelines and market windows and customers trying to migrate their designs from a seven nanometer to a five nanometer to a three nanometer in very short periods of time, increasingly there's a high level of interest in bringing automation to the whole analog uh, space. And Synopsys has been a leader in delivering a lot of productivity capabilities in the analog space with uh, uh, our offerings in the custom space. And we are really excited now that we have introduced AI into analog design. So by using AI as a way to automatically migrate analog circuits mm -hmm. from one node to the other, automatically optimizing them, uh, essentially we are really giving a significant lift in the productivity of analog designers. Because uh, they have the same amount of time, they have to migrate a whole lot of circuits, mm -hmm. and with automation and AI, that's the only way they're going to meet uh, those What are the challenges, systems. though, with the analog? Because, I mean, there are different challenges. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with analog, I think the, the one of the big challenges is, um, you know, as you move from node to node, you have to re-optimize the circuit, mm. right? Uh, you may have something wor that worked well. It's at, not iterative. It's actually total. Correct. Total, yeah. Exactly. So you may have some, a circuit working at 7 nanometer. You need to now move this to 5 nanometer, but 5 nanometer has a lot more corners. Mm. You may have a lot more objectives. Mm. And now you need to optimize your circuit iteratively with simulation to achieve those objectives. Well, that used to be a very laborious, painful task. Mm. And by using our uh, analog space optimization engine, essentially customers are able to take the schematic and the parasitics from the previous generation and essentially specify the target objectives for the next node and then the AI engine just does the whole optimization exploration and produces the new circuit, preserving many of the properties of the previous circuit. So the learning from the previous uh, uh, generation and then using that to master the next generation is really where the, the essence of the AI solution is. This, um, one of the areas I think everybody's talking about is a compute and AI. Um, and that sort of leads itself, and I had, uh, had a separate conversation with one of your other colleagues about multi-die or chiplets. Uh, how are you handling that in terms of enabling that multi-die or chiplet design through your tools? Yeah, I mean, I think we definitely see a strong momentum behind uh, the migration to chiplet-based design in the next uh, three to five years. We've done some studies that seem to indicate 40 to 50% of new design starts in the next three to five years will be multi-die designs which use chiplets. And it's kind of a, both a economic argument because the cost of advanced node die is shooting up significantly. And there's also a performance argument, yes. right? When you look at all these AI chips that are being created to train Gen AI models, the memory latency yeah. uh, is one of the big, big care abouts. And so you want to keep that processor and memory as close as possible to each other. And there again, multi-die comes in. So to build large, complex multi-die systems, there are two approaches to do it. Right. right, You can take your legacy packaging tool, PCB tool, and try to enhance it to meet those requirements, and you will fall woefully short. And the reason is you're talking about millions of connections. You're talking about very complex uh, optimization of the placement of the dies, looking at thermal issues, looking at hmm. uh, signal integrity, power integrity issues, uh, and you need to bring automation. And so our approach to this problem has been what we call as a chip-up approach, where we essentially took the strong IC foundation that Synopsys has built over so many years, and we moved that foundation up to the multi-die and system level use case. And so the capacity problem is essentially solved by architecture. Uh, with this whole hyper-converged approach, we are essentially able to bring all our sign-off technologies to the system level. We have a great partnership with, our, uh, with ANSYS uh, for multi-physics solutions, which we have tightly integrated into our platform in order to, to deal with some of the thermal and the SIPI issues. So really this chip up approach where you extend SOC level design now to system level multi-die design is the, is the correct way to solve this problem. And it's been validated by many, many customers that we have for our multi-die solutions who are essentially using this And approach. is that part of the synopsis.ai platform or is this something to- So this separate? is a, a separate design platform which we call 3D IC compiler. Uh, okay. uh, around which all the multi-die is centered. But guess what? AI plays a huge role there as well. Mm -hmm. Because 
one, uh, one, again, it's all about choices. You have many, many choices you can make with respect to where to place the dies, what type of connectivity to implement between the dies, uh, and you need to explore that solution space efficiently. Hmm. And there again, our AI engine uh, is used to do that. I guess the connectivity um, between stacks, between die, is going to be a big, big challenge. I know you briefly addressed it, but um, what, what are the challenges with that die-to-die uh, con -die connectivity? Yes, so you know it is uh, very much a performance versus cost uh, trade-off that has to be done. Like some connections are going to be uh, you know, we're going to need extremely high performance, like the compute memory connections for uh, for AI chips. Mm. Uh, some connections are going to be very cost sensitive, yeah. where you really can't burn up all your silicon uh, making those connections with silicon interposers, and you may need to move to organic interposers to manage the cost. Uh, you also need to, uh, there's a new exciting technology called hybrid bonding that enables you <clears throat> essentially to stack dies on top of each other and go to what we call as a bumpless approach, yeah, which yes, allows you to connect that. thousands of yeah. connections in a very, very short uh, latency. So, there so is you, the, you can model that in, in the tools, I That's guess. right, okay. that's right. So you have to do this exploration. And you have the system, you have a target performance and a cost envelope, and what is the right configuration of the system between what gets connected with a silicon interposer, what gets connected with organic substrate, what gets connected with a bumpless hybrid bonding stacking methodology, and how do you come up with the most optimal environment? That's really where a platform like what we are talking about, which is 3DIC compiler, enables you to do those trade-offs and do that analysis and arrive at the best implementation for your system. Okay, I, I know um, we probably can't say much about future, but uh, uh, everybody's talking about EDA and AI, sorry, AI and EDA now, and mm -hmm. um, how far can you go? What, what's next for, uh, mm -hmm. or can you tease us about anything that's <laughs> coming up? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are. Uh, I'm just so excited about the directions that are possible here, right? So one is we are, of course, uh, continuing to improve our core AI technology. Uh, so we are already in the second generation of uh, the DSO technology, where we are for, we are able to get produce even better results uh, and also reduce the total compute required for AI. Uh, we are the second part. The other part of it is the breadth. I mean, we talked about AI for uh, design and verification and test and analog. There are some exciting developments on AI for manufacturing in terms of building little models more efficiently, uh, AI for the, the timing and power ECO process uh, mm -hmm. that we will be talking about shortly. So there's a expansion to many other domains of, uh, uh, to, of EDA. And then the, the next one is that we are in the sunrise phase of Gen AI. And Gen AI with large language models is an exciting opportunity uh, to essentially weave that into the whole EDA stack as well. And, we have several explorations. So just like we led with the AI uh, and the application of AI, we expect to lead with Gen AI as well. So you, you can sort of say, can you do this simulation for me using these parameters and it'll do it? Yeah, so essentially there's some exciting capabilities in Gen AI called agents, okay. which enable you to essentially construct very complex workflows using Gen AI. Hmm. Uh, of course, you know Gen AI will impact every EDA user because your documentation and your tool support, it will be served by a Gen AI bot, very similar to, uh, to ChatGPT. Uh, right. It would, uh, you know, that is an immediate application there. And then building on that, I mean, Gen AI has uh, tremendous opportunities to build EDA collateral, building RTL, building constraints, building, uh, uh, you know, UPF uh, for power design, right? So there's a lot of opportunities there as well. So I think we are in the sunrise phase, a lot of explorations going on. And uh, again, the underlying theme is productivity, productivity, productivity. How do we enable a, a small specialized workforce that's not growing too fast to mm. be able to do a lot more designs with high level of automation and AI? A new sunrise in EDA. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, Shankar, thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for the opportunity.